Okay, can you see my PowerPoint? Great, thank you. Yeah, it's coming through. Well, hello everyone, greetings from cloudy France. Um, I'm delighted and honored to be here. What a, a lovely occasion and I hope you're having a good time. And I'm following a panel on Christopher Tolkien with a talk on about the Silmarillion. So there were many adaptations of Tolkien in the form of illustrated editions in the 1990s. In 1998 only, we had David Wyatt's Hobbit and Ted Nasmith's Silmarillion. Nasmith's well-known and well-loved version was released shortly after another illustrated Silmarillion by Francis Mosley for the Folio Society. Um, Mosley had already worked several times for this publishing house, but he was given a rather unusual task with this commission. Its roots go back to the 1970s when the Folio Society published The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. In this presentation, I will shed light on this lesser known illustrated Silmarillion and how it was conceived. To do so, I had the pleasure of getting in touch with the artist himself, Francis Mosley, who agreed to answer some of my questions. So I'd like to thank him for his time and for allowing me to show his illustrations during my presentation. Uh, please bear in mind that his images are under copyright. Last year at Tolkien 2019, I gave a talk all about the 1977 edition of The Lord of the Rings, so I won't go back in details. But to summarize, this edition was illustrated by the Princess, the princess Margaret of Denmark under the pseudonym of Ingerhild Grothmer and by Eric Fraser, a British illustrator. The princess and Tolkien had exchanged letters and she had enclosed some sketches that the professor really liked. These sketches were redrawn by Fraser to become the 1977 edition of The Lord of the Rings. In 1979, Eric Fraser alone illustrated The Hobbit for the same publishing house. He took care to keep a similar style in his pictures so that the books would form a whole. 20 years later, the Folio Society wished to publish an illustrated Silmarillion. Sadly, Eric Fraser had passed away in 1983. The publishers turned to Francis Mosley, who had worked with them since the early 1980s, illustrating, for instance, novels by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The set of Tolkien books by the Folio Society had to have a visual unity. This implied a similar repartition of the illustrations uh, within the pages with a full page frontispiece illustration and smaller landscape format chapter headings. But it also meant for Mosley to create pictures in the style of another artist, or rather two other artists. Mosley describes his own style as, I quote, a quite traditional pen and ink cross etch style in the tradition of Teniel and a lot of the Pench illustrators of the late 19th century. End of quotation. He usually works in gradients of grey rather than solid black and white. He draws on a surface twice the size of the finished picture. It's a common illustration trick which enables the artist to be more precise and detailed than in a smaller piece. For the Silmarillion, he started with pencil sketches and then traced over with pen. The black areas were pa painted in gouache and he added details where needed in white. Gouache is very opaque. It's a water-based medium which lends itself quite well to contrasted pieces in black and white. It enabled Mosley to imitate Fraser's distinctive style that he describes as, I quote, more wood engraving like, more patterned. And indeed, Fraser favored areas of solid black contrasting with a white background. Mosley considered this an interesting challenge and enjoyed exploring a completely different style with the reassurance that the pictures that started it all, the princess's drawings, had been enjoyed by Tolkien himself. There was a voluntary continuity. Mosley studied Fraser's illustrations and copied some features 
such as, I quote him, the scales on Eric Fraser's dragons. He paid attention to the small details that would make his illustrations echo those of his predecessor. In chapter 20, for instance, he copied Smoke's anatomy to depict another dragon. This illustration is inspired by the following lines from the Silmarillion. Morgoth lost his last strength and Enband was emptied. There came wolves and wolf riders and there came balrogs and dragons and Glaurung, father of dragons. The strength and terror of the great worm were now great indeed." Unquote. Mosley's dragon is pictured in three quarters, launching himself into battle amidst the army of Morgoth. His great black wings stand out against the white walls of Engbands. The only dragon described in detail in the book is Glaurung. In the next chapter of Turin Turambar, he is shown as a coiling great worm with serpent eyes. Marsley was well aware of Glaurung's characteristics and chose to stay faithful to Fraser's archetype by illustrating another dragon from the host of Morgoth. He explains, and uh, again I quote him, any dragon I drew followed Fraser's original conception of Smaug. Chapter headings play a different role to illustrations embodied in the text. They are not trying to show what happened, but to set the mood. The dragon shown was not a depiction of Glaurung, who was wingless." Unquote. In chapter 20, Mosley didn't take the most expected path. He chose to illustrate the impression of fear surrounding the dragon in order to make sure his book tied in with Fraser's pictures in previous editions. Within the book, another type of unity is achieved by reusing motifs from one illustration to another. For instance, vaulted ceilings appear in three different locations. We have Aule's underground halls in chapter 2, the, fastne the fastness of Mendos in chapter 6, and Menegroth in chapter 10. By limiting the visual overload that a book like The Silmarillion can inspire, the artist leaves room for the reader's imagination. And this was essential for Tolkien. In footnote E of On Fairy Stories, he declared that illustrations did not serve a fantasy text in that they put forth one interpretation and prevented the readers from creating their own mental images. Mosley, like Fraser and Princess Margaretha before him, countered this argument by a stylization, of, a stylization of shapes that doesn't pin down exactly what something or someone looks like. This enables him to repeat the motif of the vaulted ceiling without making the reader feel like all scenes take place in the same location, because he introduces variations in each illustration. Whether this is a conscious decision on Mosley's part or not, his choice of subjects to depict creates a unity within the book. This choice could be a question of taste if an artist enjoys a particular scene, but more often the criteria are slightly different. Here is a point on which Francis Mosley and Ted Nasmith, who have worked on the same text, follow opposite directions. Nasmith likes to illustrate moments of tension when dramatic action is taking place, whether this concerns characters, as in the Kinslaying at Alcolonde, or the whole invented world. Mosley usually stayed away from those moments and looked for passages with interesting imagery in his own words. Only a third of his illustrations depict characters, and most of them are very stylized or seen from afar. Most of the time, he chose more evocative subjects, for instance in chapter 4 of Thingol and Melian. This very short chapter describes Melian's songs and her meeting with Elway, who later becomes known as Thingol. To illustrate it, Mosley used the visual metaphor of the bird for Melian and the motif of the tree. The latter is self-explanatory and represents both the forest where Melian dwelt and the one where she came to live with Thingol in Doriath. The artist combined the, combined the two elements in his picture. He kept the, the shapes quite simple with almost no sense of perspective, except the fact that the trees in the foreground are smaller than the birds in the foregr in the foreground.
the trees in the background, sorry, are smaller than the trees in the foreground. The symmetry enhances the overall, the overall symbolism of the piece, which manages to evoke the contents of the chapter without actually spoiling any of it for the reader. According to Mosley, illustrations should neither distract from the text nor contradict it, but they should e echo, expand or play with the story. As he explains, I quote him, there is a balance to be struck between the image in the writing that is visually most appealing and yet avoiding choosing the most dramatic events where there is a risk that your interpretation could come into conflict with the reader's imagination. In chapter 10, Tolkien gives a precise description. The pillars of Menegroth were hewn in the likeness of the beaches of Orome. So here this image appealed and I give it form. What you hope is that the pictures complement the writing, not that they create a story, but perhaps allow you to look around within the story that, that has been written. End of quotation. Mosley often used symbolism in his illustrations to detach them from the narration while still inscribing them in the world. It's also a way for the pictures to reach beyond the limited space devoted to them at the beginning of each chapter. In chapter one of the Quinta Cimmerillion of the beginning of days, Mosley represented the two trees of Valinor. In the story, these sacred trees indicate time through their waxing and waning. Mosley didn't make clear which one was Telperion, the silver tree, and which one was Laurelin, the golden one. In that regard, the artist illustrates a specific passage of the text when Tolkien describes the, I quote, gentle hour of softer light when both trees were faint and their gold and silver beams were mingled." Unquote. Mosley even depicted the beams of light issuing from them. And yet his picture is open to interpretations since there is no color to differentiate the two trees. Mosley doesn't repeat what the text already says but offers a symbolic representation of the trees. Even though he had a design brief in that he had to create pictures in a specific style, the commission left him with a certain amount of creative freedom. Most of the locations, people and artifacts in the book were unheard of in The Lord of the Rings or in The Hobbit, so he couldn't take inspiration from Fraser as he had done with dragons. Knowing the writer's field of study, Mosley turned to the Anglo-Saxon period in several of his illustrations. The most striking example is chapter 21 of Turin Turamba. This picture uh, will, feel will feel familiar to people who share Tolkien's interests, since it's largely inspired by the Anglo-Saxon helmet discovered at Sutton Hoo in 1939. Tolkien did not describe Turin's helmets precisely in the text. One is referred to as, I quote, the dragon helm of Dor Lomin but it's not Turin's only helmet. Later in the text is mentioned, I quote, a dwarf mask all gilded. The motif of the helm permeates the chapter in additional ways. Turin names himself Gorthol, the dread helm, and the different names he takes move the story forward. Identity is a strong theme in his tale, being alternately hidden and revealed, and mostly enhanced this by picturing an impressive helmet, hiding the features of the character wearing it. A simple juxtaposition of the illustration with a photograph of the, of the certain Who helmet reveals the deep influence of the latter on the former. Mosley adapted several features from the lower half of the helmet, including the fact that most of the face is hidden by decorative plates. He also highlighted the very name of this piece of armor as the dragon helm. To do so, Mosley took the silhouette of a flying beast on the certain Who helmet, with its wings as the helmet's eyebrows and tail as moustache. He made it even more visible by having the dragon's face protruding from the crown of the helmet and its wings extending on either side. This particular illustration blends seamlessly historical influences and Tolkien's own motifs. The helmets, on described in details, in details in the text, 
but it's worth noting when Tolkien wrote The Children of Hurin. According to Christopher Tolkien, his, fa his father worked on a poem version until 1924-1925. He then devoted himself to other stories that would form the future Silmarillion until 1937, when he turned to The Hobbit and later to The Lord of the Rings. He only came back to the earlier history of Middle-earth from 1950 onwards. At this date, the certain who grave had been unearthed in Suffolk, and Tolkien was most probably aware of the discoveries, but I haven't found evidence that he was inspired by the findings. The last idea I'd like to explore is that of the placement of the pictures within the book and how they, they interact with the text. Some illustrators take great care to depict the passages closest to where the illustrations are put in a book. Alan Lee, for instance, doesn't want the reader to leave through the volume searching for a correspondence between the image and the text. This often leads him to illustrate passages of lesser dramatic intensity because he cannot choose where the pictures appear. Ted Nasmith was also careful to place text and image close to each other in his 1998 illustrated Silmarillion. However, he was free to place the images where he wanted because the book was printed on a glossy paper which supports both text and image, so he could choose the subjects he most wanted to paint. Mosley, on the reverse, is not necessarily looking for such closeness because, because the place devoted to the images is fixed. With the only exception of the frontispiece, they are set above each chapter title. In some instances, Mosley chooses to illustrate exclusively the first lines of the section. In other chapters, he anticipates on the text. On those occasions, his often symbolic style prevents the reader from being spoiled too much of the story. When chapter 19 of Beren and Luthien opens, there is no telling who the two animals are. The readers will discover what the illustration is about only after reading the corresponding passage in the chapter. In this case, the interpretation is rather straightforward, but it isn't always so. In chapter 6 of Fernor and the Unchaining of Melkor, the readers are free to interpret the, the illustration in different ways. It could either depict Melkor being kept prisoner, buried under coal, coils of chains, or it might just as well represent his unchaining, since the character is invisible. Mosley plays, plays with showing and hiding to keep the reader in doubt and not reveal too much since the title of the chapter already tells quite a lot about its contents. In such illustrations, the artist leaves interpretation to the readers, making them take part in the relation between text and image. Without being aware of it, he complied to one of Christopher Tolkien's wishes. Working with Alan Lee, Christopher Tolkien asked him explicitly not to depict Melkor in Beren and Luthien. By avoiding the representation of characters, Mosley came to the same conclusion and used visual metaphors in many cases. To conclude, the Folio Society undertook to publish an illustrated Silmarillion in a decade when many new illustrated Tolkien books appeared. They paid attention to the author's opinion on illustrations in order to create a book in which text and image worked hand in hand. For Francis Mosley, this meant an exercise in artistic flexibility as he studied another artist's style and made it his own by exploring new subjects and landscapes. Thank you for your attention. And again, many thanks to the Tolkien Society for organizing this seminar. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Marie, for um, sharing that research with us. It's fantastic to see um, and really dig into the different types um, of illustrations that were provided for different um, places of Tolkien's work. I found it quite interesting when you were talking about um, how um, the artist kind of like chooses their moments 
as well. So the idea of not wanting to impact on the flow, perhaps of an action sequence, found that quite interesting, something I'd not really considered uh, before. So thank you very much. Um, so we have time for some questions. So um, like we did in the last half, if you have any questions for Marie, um, then please either raise your hand if you'd like to ask her a verbal question or in the Q&A, just write your question down. Please do not put it in the chats. So any, any questions? Okay, Tim, straight on. Tim just appeared and then disappeared. Okay, so um, here we go. So we've got a question coming up for uh, the Megan family. So there we go. Over to you. Just got to unmute. Hello. 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 Um, thank you so much. This has been a really wonderful presentation, Murray. Um, my question is. How, in your research, have you found any indication that Tolkien himself was familiar with the Sutton Who finds um, a different chat that I'm, I'm uh, involved in right now while we're discussing the seminar? We're talking about how um, there are some similarities between the Sutton Who finds, particularly the, the helmet that you've pictured and the mask that you've pictured in your presentation and um, the, the body that Aragorn discovers uh, on the paths of the dead. And so I wonder if there's any concrete information on that. Yes, we can, we can read a lot of similarities in the text, but I haven't found anything. Um, I only had access to Tolkien's letters while I was preparing this talk, so I couldn't check in other books if any other scholar um, studied that, so I can't, uh, I can't answer uh, your question, sorry, I'll have to check when the library is open again. <laughs> uh, Will, I'm, s I'm afraid I can't hear you. Is it sorry, me? I'd accidentally okay. muted. Um, <laughs> so, sorry, we have a question from Tim as well, asking what is your favourite image um, that you have researched? Um, from Francis Mosley only or from any artist? <laughs> In general. Um, okay, that's a lot of illustrations. I'm studying um, Ang Anglophone ed editions of Tolkien's Middle Earth texts. So I have some 20 books and that's a lot of illustrations. <laughs> I'm afraid I, I'm, I'd have a hard time picking a favorite. It changes every, almost every day. So it's often Alan Lee because I just love his work, but um, it's often Osgiliath from The Lord of the Rings. I just love this illustration. But tomorrow it will probably be another one. As is the nature with research. <laughs> um, super. Um, and we've got one more. Uh, we've got another question asking, um, was the black and white a deliberate choice um, of Francis, Francis Moses or was it an editorial choice? It was definitely an editorial choice because the the Tolkien books by the Folio Society, at least the, uh, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, were illustrated in black and white because uh, it was uh, the paper didn't allow for color to be used. So the first ones were in black and white and to make them tie in with each other, uh, the Silmarillion, it was decided that it would be in black and white as well. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, are there any more questions for Marie at all? Okay, in that case, um, Marie, I would like to warmly thank you for um, sharing your research with us. Really interesting insight into uh, the way that artists have presented talking on the page, illustrated the actual text itself. Thank you very much. Thank um, you for I, would me. I would, 
Thank you.